Thank you very much for joining our study. This is a personal understanding uh, of the Baha'i Writings. It is only my view on it. For an official view, turn to the Baha'i Scriptures themselves, please, and visit baha'i.org. Um, I wish to thank the uh, Baha'i World Administration, uh, all those that are serving their communities out there. And please note that there is an audio file, uh, so you can listen to this presentation instead of viewing it. And also, any quotes that are used will be in a PDF in the description. So today's topic is about the Bible and Christianity's relationship to the Baha'i Faith and to other religions in general. We're going to be looking at uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament and seeing how it actually teaches the independent investigation of truth. Oftentimes, as Baha'is, we might look at the principle of independent investigation, that someone should actually be seeking out truth unfettered uh, by tradition or background or upbringing, um, but also independent of the position or perspectives of their priest, their rabbi, their mullah, their imam. Um, this is an aspect of the religions of our world uh, that is really across the board, that God has enjoined upon humankind the duty to investigate for their own selves. When we look at this from the context of um, the New Testament and the Old Testament, the Christian and Jewish Bible, if you will, um, it does not depend on the Baha'i Faith itself being true. This is just, does the Bible itself teach that we cannot brush off the claims of someone who uh, states that they're actually coming from God with a message for humankind? I think at times, for many people uh, within the Christian community, it seems as if there is no need to test uh, another prophetic claim. The idea is, is that um, I have Jesus Christ, I am saved through his message, I, I therefore do not need to look around to investigate to see if someone like the Buddha, or Krishna, or the Prophet Muhammad, or the Bab and Baha'u'llah are actually bringing a message from God. I am saved. This is the idea, um, and really we should empathize with it, because Jesus Christ does say he is the only way to God. There is no other name under heaven by which you may be saved. And also that from a Christian perspective, the, the various religions they look at look foreign to them. They believe in a triune God, for example, um, whereas they look at Buddhism or Hinduism and see something very peculiar. So that actually, in a sense, ceases their investigation. And our question has to be, uh, is that, according to the New Testament and the Old Testament, an acceptable act, an acceptable way of being? We will be looking at, uh, in another video, um, why the Bible itself, the New Testament, if you will, actually, on the surface, seems to actually contradict the Old Testament, and that we have to be very careful about how we approach claims of truth, because they're not always so obvious or self-evident. We cannot rely upon a minister, a priest, a mullah, a monk, to tell us if a claim of a message from God is true or not. I think we can all understand this, because uh, if someone is a Christian, they know from the New Testament that, of course, the, the leaders of the Jewish community themselves were telling the people that Jesus was not true. We have to understand that we have to, on our own, an independent investigation of truth, seek out to see if this prophet, for example, is actually a true one. I think it's also very important, as we look at this topic, to, to realize um, that this is a concern in the New Testament, the concern about false prophets. So it'd be, I think it's very important to actually read some, some quotes so that, say, we as Baha'is can truly empathize with the concerns of the Christian community. Uh, the New Testament is very explicit that false prophets are coming and will attempt to lead people astray. So let's take a look at some of them. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. 
Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. So here they were being told that in the future, people will not be enduring sound doctrine, will not be holding to the truths of the New Testament, but they will begin to accumulate teachers to themselves that tell them what they want to hear, that will be tickling their ears. So often we might say, as a Christian, look at the Baha'i Faith, even see its beauties, and say, ah, but you just wish your ears to be tickled, so you're accumulating teachers that tell you what you wish to hear. Another quote from 2 Peter. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. Bringing swift destruction upon themselves, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep." Again, I think it's important to understand how disconcerting a passage like this is, that you again have individuals who will come and introduce destructive heresies, bringing destruction, and that they are following their sensuality. And I don't think that simply means sexuality. It is actually the desire to be told what they want to hear. And this has to be, this must be a concern of any individual who is a disciple of the New Testament. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Again, in the later times, deceitful spirits will come out and lead people away. Matthew 24 Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise, and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance, if, they, if therefore they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go forth, or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. This quote, out of all other quotes, seems to really justify an outright and immediate rejection of Baha'u'llah, or the Prophet Muhammad, or Buddha, because it's saying that individuals will come to you and tell you, oh, the Christ is over here, or the Christ is over there, and Jesus, who is speaking here, says, do not believe them. And it's important because we have to realize how this would feel when a Baha'i approaches a Christian and is actually presenting the Baha'i faith as the fulfillment and, to be explicit, the return of Christ. Because that person is going to hear Matthew 24 in their head. Do not believe them. So how can we overcome this? And this is something very important to understand because if we're inviting our friends, say, to a devotional, if we're asking them to engage with us in teaching children's classes or doing junior youth groups, we're inviting them to work collectively with, with us within a community, um, they, they have this in their head. This will be a concern for them, and it's something that we have to be able and willing to actually remove the apprehensions of this person so that we can join with them together in serving humanity. So now we're going to just look at three quick quotes uh, regarding independent investigation and how to seek with your own heart and your own mind. Um, one from the Old Testament and two from the New Testament. The first one comes from the book of Proverbs in chapter 18. Um, these quotes are really about being very concerned about our own biases uh, that actually prevent us from investigating something. Proverbs 18.13 he who gives an answer before he hears it, 
It is a folly and shame to him. Right off the bat, <laughs> to think of actually deciding on something before you have actually really heard a claim or an idea or what <laughs> someone has to say. Um, but the book of Proverbs here is saying it's not just folly or error, but it's actually shameful. It, it's shameful for us to have someone come up to present some truth to us, even if it's false, and to decide on it prior to actually hearing it out. And this doesn't mean we have to do it with our mouths, it can just be in our head, or an individual is coming up and sharing some idea with us, but because of our own prejudices and biases, we shut it down before any actual investigation has occurred. Um, this quote we see, I believe, actually really borne out in a story about Jesus Christ himself. This is from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 7. Some of the people therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, This certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, This is the Christ. Still others were saying, Surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why do you not bring him? The officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd which does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? So in this story, Jesus Christ is speaking, and many people are around trying to figure out who he is. Is he the prophet? Is he the Christ? Um, they're discussing the claim of Jesus and his station. Uh, and a division occurs in the crowd, and the officers who are sent by the high priests and the, and the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, um, are sent to bring him. They come back without Jesus. And they're saying, well, why didn't you bring him back? Um, these officers actually uh, point to the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Never has a man spoken this way, the way he speaks. They actually then, the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jewish community, then turn and say, oh, like, have you been led astray? And their answer is that none of the rulers or the Pharisees has believed in him. So none of the leaders of the Jewish community have accepted Jesus' claim. And then say, but this crowd, which doesn't know the law, the Torah, the, the, the Jewish scriptures, they're accursed, meaning they're uneducated individuals, and they're neither rulers nor are they religious leaders. Nicodemus, one of them, turns and says, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? To me, this is why this sounds exactly like Proverbs 18.13. Uh, he who gives an answer before he hears it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. He's actually turning to the Jewish leaders and saying, but you're not actually following your own law. You're saying, in essence, that these people don't know the law. And he says, but you're not following that same law that you're talking about because you are judging someone before you have truly heard what they have to say, before you yourself have really investigated that claim. So can I say as a disciple of the New Testament, accept the, the leaders and rulers of the religious and secular communities, um, their judgment on a prophetic claim, the claim of someone actually bringing a message from God? I think the answer is clearly no because I have not heard from this individual. I have not actually investigated him. That would be folly and shame. Uh, the next quote, which is from the book of Acts, which is the story of the apostles after Jesus' ascension into heaven, and uh, greatly the story of the apostle Paul, um, gives actually the opposite perspective on actually how we should approach these things. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. 
Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So Paul and Silas, two great teachers of the New Testament, um, are being sent to Berea, a city. They were previously in Thessalonica, another city. When they come to actually Berea, they enter the synagogue, the church or temple of the Jewish people. And it says, these Jews, these were more noble-minded. So the people that they met in Berea were far more noble-minded than those they met in Thessalonica. And why? Why is the New Testament saying that these individuals are noble-minded? It's explicit, it says, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. So they hear of the message of Jesus Christ from Paul and Silas, and they receive it with great eagerness, not deciding that it is true, but being eager to search the scriptures to see if these things are true. And I think the New Testament is asking us as individuals, are we going to be like those of Berea or those of Thessalonica? Because we can receive with eagerness a claim that a message has come from God, but at the same time, not just immediately accept it, but search the scriptures to see whether that is those things are so. So they themselves did not judge a matter before they heard it out. They avoided both the folly and the shame. The shame here is being placed upon the Jews of Thessalonica because they did not receive with eagerness and they did not search whereas Berea become noble-minded by the definition of investigation. I think it's clear from these, and there are many more quotes we could look at, uh, these are only a select few, but the, the, the Bible itself um, censures very heavily a prejudicial uh, approach to claims of truth and beauty. I think we will now see, through some of the scriptures that we're going to look at, the New Testament not only tells us that we shouldn't be prejudiced, uh, nor simply that we should be, be aware of false prophets coming, but that actually prophets are coming, and it is our duty to investigate their claims. While this may come as a surprise uh, to many people, I think the, the testimony of the New Testament itself is very, very clear on this point. So our first quote is from uh, 1 Thessalonians. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. So are we to despise prophetic utterances? No. Who gives prophetic utterances? Prophets. Uh, this would be quenching the spirit, but rather that we're to examine everything carefully, to see if it is true, and then hold fast to that which is good. And I think this is important for anyone to actually notice <laughs> uh, within the New Testament. It's talking uh, about us being unbiased, investigative, and open even to claims of prophetic utterances. The Bible does not teach a closed-minded, you know, turning away from other claims or truths that might contradict how we see things. Rather, it is examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. But we can only do that if we've examined carefully. And again, in this context, it's talking about prophetic utterances. Our next quote is from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets, and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. This is Jesus speaking. And however we might interpret the term prophet, right? what does prophet mean? It is very, very clear that he, Jesus Christ, is saying he is sending prophets, coming after him. And we're supposed to not despise prophetic utterances. We're supposed to not judge something before we've heard it. So we see that the New Testament is telling prophetic utterances are coming, Jesus Christ himself after him will be sending prophets, and then we have to investigate them. What's really important 
actually to note about this is that this quote about him sending prophets is actually one chapter before Matthew 24, where he says, Do not believe them if they say, Here is the Christ, there is the Christ. You might still say, Well, one is about uh, the Christ, and one is about prophets. And I would, I would suggest that this, this time that's fine. It's that maybe you should not believe anyone who says that they're the Christ, but it's still at the same time, one chapter prior, Jesus Christ is telling the Christian community that he is sending prophets. The next quote is from uh, the seventh chapter of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. In this passage from Matthew, we're being told that there can be sheep that are actually wolves, that it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, and that uh, there are bad trees with rotten fruit that can make us sick and ill. What's important about this quote is actually, one, it's speaking about prophets, Two, yes, it is warning about false prophets, but it's actually telling the Christians to test the fruits, and to test the fruits of two different kinds of trees. One a good fruit, good tree, good fruit, one bad tree, bad fruit, to see whether or not they are a true or a false prophet. Jesus can't possibly, in my mind, here be telling the Christian community, uh, you will know them by their fruits, the good tree and the bad tree, um, and go test those fruits to see whether they are good or bad, but at the same time telling the Christian community, but there will never be good ones. Jesus can't possibly be telling humanity not to investigate, and at the exact same time telling them they have to investigate to see if these fruits are good or bad. We're forced to the conclusion that the world in the future will contain two kinds of trees, two kinds of fruits. Good trees, true prophets, bad trees, bad, false prophets. And that we actually have to select and test each of the fruits of these figures. Thus the New Testament clearly states we have to investigate prophetically. If Jesus Christ's intention was to say that no prophets are coming after him, he would actually tell them they don't have to test. Don't worry about it, there's not going to be any good trees. But in this context, it's the exact opposite. No, there's two kinds of trees. Good trees and bad trees, true prophets and false prophets, and we have to test their fruit. At the same time, we still have this issue where Jesus Christ says, do not believe them. And I think there is a passage in the first epistle of John that really fleshes this out and enables us to understand what's going on. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I think this quote brings together uh, many of the themes that we've been looking at so far, because we have this warning of false prophets, or false teachers, false Christs. At the same time, we know that Jesus is returning and prophetic figures are coming, some of them, as we shall see, very large. Uh, right here it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test them. And I think we can now bring in this concept that we get from Acts 17 about the Jews of Berea. Jesus Christ is telling us to test prophetic claims, telling us to examine things, but at the same time as saying in Matthew 24, do not believe them. John here is telling us explicitly, don't believe them. He agrees fully with Jesus Christ, and I think gives us a perspective of how this can actually be resolved. Because he too is saying, don't believe them, but, or rather, test them. Meaning, be discerning, right? Be the noble-minded Bereans to investigate and see if these things are true. 
know that he is sending you prophets, as we saw from Matthew 23, but don't jump immediately. Be discerning. Do not answer a matter before you hear it. That doesn't mean uh, uh, reject before you hear it. That also means don't accept before you hear it. Thus, do not believe them in Matthew 24. Yes, beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. The topic here is prophets. And that to see whether they are from God, whether they are a good tree with good fruit, or a bad tree with bad fruit, is the duty, based, but we have to test them. So if, again, the New Testament is telling us to test to see whether they are from God or not, we know that some are coming that are from God. So now when we actually go back to Matthew 24, and someone says, well, here is the Christ, there is the Christ, no, don't believe them. That would be contradicting the New and Old Testament explicitly. What do we do? We test the Spirit to see whether it is from God. So when Jesus is saying, do not believe them, He's not saying they are false, that necessarily they must be rejected. He's saying, do not think that they're immediately false, nor think that they're immediately true. You actually have to do what? Be discerning, be noble-minded, and test the spirits. There is a concern with the presentation so far that might arise, and it's a very legitimate one. Uh, when Jesus Christ says that prophets are coming, that he's sending prophets, when we're told by the New Testament that we must not despise prophetic utterances, but investigate them, to not believe every spirit, but to test the spirits to see whether they are from God, uh, many Christians will hear uh, the idea of an, what we might call an in-church prophet. And there's reason to actually see this this way. Um, we're going to read a passage from uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. There are different kinds of gifts but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one it is the same God at work. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge, by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're being told that different powers of the Spirit are beginning to different individuals within the community of Christ. And one of those is to another the spirit of prophecy. That it is often seen that these prophets that Jesus Christ is actually talking about are individuals within the church that are prophesying, giving wisdom and meaning from God. So we might see these individuals as being, well, when Jesus Christ talks about spirits coming, uh, prophets coming, he's talking about just individuals within the church speaking truth. And we have to test it to see whether that truth, if you will, is from God. It's as if uh, we might look at it as this being prophets with like a really, really lowercase tiny p. Uh, it's not talking, one might say, that the New Testament is suggesting that large prophets will come. For example, prophets like Moses or Elijah or uh, you know, Isaiah or Ezekiel, prophets which actually bring books. Or, or scrolls or texts that have to be included within the scriptures themselves. So we do have to remember this because this is part of the New Testament itself. The question I would ask is, is the term prophet actually limited to this within the New Testament? Because if I want to understand what a prophet is or can be and how high that station can be, I have to root that, if you will, within the New Testament itself, to see if it itself is limiting it to only this small p. In a sense, how big is the door? Can we only have small, lower p, lowercase p prophets entering that are coming? Or is this something large enough 
to, if you will, admit an Ezekiel, an Isaiah, a Moses, or even another Christ. So where are we going to draw this line about what kinds of prophets can be coming, or what stature or status of prophets can be coming? Uh, in order to do this, let's look at some more quotes from the New Testament. One of the aspects of the use of this term in the New Testament even relates to the relationship between Christianity and Islam. Uh, oftentimes it's seen or stated that, well, the Quran actually states that Jesus is only a prophet. Yet, as we'll see, the New Testament itself, and Jesus himself, calls himself a prophet. This quote is from Acts chapter 3. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. In this section of Acts, it is actually quoting a prophecy from the Old Testament. That's why it says, For Moses truly said to the fathers. And it comes uh, from Deuteronomy 18, uh, 15 to 19. And Peter here is actually applying this to the person of Jesus Christ. He's saying to the Jews, But Moses told you, right? The prophets told you that a time would come when the Messiah would appear. And Moses truly said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like unto me. This is now here being applied to Jesus Christ himself, meaning the term prophet is being applied to Jesus. Then Moses is saying, He shall be like me. Our next quote is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 to 29. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And then quotes a prophecy. And then it says, And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly I say to you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. This story we can also see in uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 to 6, and Matthew 13, 57, and John 4, 44. It's retold within the Gospels. And it's that Jesus Christ is in Nazareth, his home city, and is actually walks into the synagogue, picks up a scroll, reads a prophecy from Isaiah, and relates that prophecy to himself. The Jews themselves get upset, and he says, Assuredly I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And they then grab him to throw him off a hill. So in this context, Jesus Christ is applying the term prophet to himself. So we see in the book of Acts, Jesus Christ is said to be a prophet, like unto Moses, and here he himself refers to himself <laughs> as a prophet. So what can the term prophet mean within the New Testament? It can actually mean figures as great and as large as Moses and Jesus Christ. The following is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, uh, verses 22 for context, then 31 to 35. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. 
Just at that time, some Pharisees approached, saying to him, Go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. There's much to be discussed in this, in this passage, but in its essence, Jesus Christ is going towards Jerusalem. Um, some of the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jewish community, come up and they're saying, go away and leave here, Herod wants to kill you. And he says, uh, I must continue, I must reach my goal, which is the city of Jerusalem, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside Jerusalem. Therefore, he himself is a prophet. Uh, so we can't really protest, if you will, to calling Jesus Christ a prophet, given that in multiple places Jesus himself calls him a prophet, and in the book of Acts he is called a prophet. But more so that this cannot be that the term in the New Testament, when it says prophets are coming and to test their fruits and to not be biased and to investigate them, only applies to little p or small door prophets. It must include individuals potentially at least, as great as Jesus and Moses, because the term prophet incorporates all these definitions. The following quote is from the book of Revelations in chapter 11. Now there are many interpretations and many views on the meaning of this passage, um, but let's take a look at it and how it relates to the concept of prophets. It's important to note here that this is actually a prophecy of something that will happen in the future. And in it God says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven, so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. And then continues, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And later continues, And those who dwell on earth will rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on earth. Now after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. So this passage is talking about two witnesses that are to come. But later it calls them prophets. These individuals, it says, has the power to shut up heaven, to stop the rain, to strike the earth with plagues, to have fire precede out. And many, if you look at these actual symbols that are being presented about these figures, are signs that Moses performed, signs that Elijah performed great figures, great prophetic figures of the Old Testament, and that these figures will be tormented and killed and then raised. Now this uh, entire chapter is actually interpreted by Abdu'l-Baha in some answered questions. The point here, however, is simply that it seems very clear that these are actually prophets. Why? Because it says they're prophets. It seems clear that they're very powerful, given the symbols that are used to represent them, and that these are to come in the future. So as a Christian, as a disciple of the New Testament, we have to realize that there are figures coming, prophetic figures of great, great power, especially since prophets itself can actually apply, be applied to Jesus Christ and to Moses. I think at this point it's important that we can agree that um, 
the New Testament and the Old Testament teaches that we must investigate without bias. That prophets are coming, and that that term prophet can include individuals as great and as powerful as Jesus Christ and Moses, let alone Isaiah's and Ezekiel's and Daniel's or in-house church prophets. I think there's an aspect of the independent investigation in this context that has to be considered. Um, I would say there is a vast, vast difference between investigating to see if a prophet is from God, or testing the Spirit to see whether or not it's from God, and educating yourself to prove that one is false. Um, this is, these are two radically different things. The independent investigation doesn't mean walking in before you've heard something and trying to find reasons to reject it. And I think this is often what happens, because I will actually have a discussion with a friend or brother or sister from the Christian community and other communities as well, that will say, well, I have investigated, I have looked at them. Um, but what this often actually is incorporated of, or incorporated by, is actually seeking, say, anti-Buddhist uh, <laughs> websites written by Christians, or looking actually at Islam from the viewpoint of biblical scholars or priests or ministers that were actively attempting to show that it's false. But this would be like walking up to the, the Jewish rabbis, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and asking them what they think of the claim of Jesus Christ. It's important to note that this, uh, if you will, a false investigation can actually be even in the case where someone has taken the time, say, to read the Qur'an or the Bhagavad Gita, if they're a Christian, but do so, and their fundamental sorting is actually looking for problems and obstacles. Oftentimes this is actually how it's carried out. I think this is really important, which we'll be looking at in another video, which has to do um, with actually how God tests His servants. Because it will be, and we will investigate this, it is important to understand that the New Testament and the message of Jesus Christ itself was, I think I can say, self-evidently seen as going against what the Jewish people expect, expected. That there are aspects of the first coming of Jesus Christ that seem very, very peculiar to a Jewish mind. So if they were approaching right, uh, the claims of Jesus Christ, like the Jews of Thessalonica, and just looking at it on its surface level, they would have rejected Jesus Christ. There are many facets of the, of the Christian message that from a Jewish perspective, if only looked at the surface, can be actually very upsetting, and we'll even see can be offensive to the Jewish people. And really reading, say, the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or the writings of the Buddha with a state of being, with the heart of seeking contradictions and seeking to disprove, I would suggest must necessarily be wrong, because any Christian, uh, any Christian would suggest that this would be the uh, totally inappropriate and unjust way to approach the New Testament if you were a Jew, or an atheist, right, or a Buddhist, or a Hindu. A very important aspect of this study is to understand, I believe, how this relates to the questions of exclusivism. That there is only one way to God, which is through Jesus Christ. And also the belief in this uh, vein that, say, if I'm a Christian, I myself am saved. I do not need to look any further. I have Jesus. In the end, uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, no man cometh to the Father except through me. And I think it's really important to note that if we're going to say Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, uh, this is his way. This is the New Testament speaking and actually telling the Christian community that they have to investigate. That is his way and that is his truth. Um, I don't think we can separate what his way and what his truth is from what he's actually told us to do. That we are to be disciples of Jesus Christ, be his followers, uh, which includes actually 
obeying what he has told us to do. And his revelation unto humankind has told humanity to test the spirits, to see whether they're from God. His truth and his way includes that he will send prophets. His truth and his way is that figures are coming that must be investigated, and that this is life, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And it's, it's something it, that's so important, because I often will suggest, imagine if we took every Bible on the planet and took out the book of Isaiah, or took out Ezekiel, or took out Psalms, or pulled the Gospel of John out of it, or stripped it of actual scripture. Uh, I think anyone who has a love for Jesus Christ and, and the New Testament and the Old Testament would see what an unfathomable tragedy that would actually be. And this is what he's trying to tell us, that if you love me, uh, you will keep my commandments. This is from uh, John 14. That we're, if we love Jesus Christ, and we see him as the way, the truth, and the life, then we will actually keep his commandments, follow what the New Testament says, and the New Testament tells us that we must investigate, investigate without bias, that prophets are coming, and that I think if we're not being arbitrary in our definition of what prophet means, a prophet, the term which is applied to Jesus Christ himself. And this investigation, the truth and the way of Jesus Christ, is linked to life, to salvation. That we're told that we must investigate to see if these spirits are from God, um, because he is sending prophets to us. And often, uh, the people will say, well, I have Jesus Christ. But of course, that's what the Jews would have said about Moses. Well, I have Moses. Uh, for example, in John 9.27, um, an individual asks the Jewish leaders if they wish to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he says, no, they say, sorry, uh, no, I'm a disciple of Moses. They saw their relationship with Moses, with the law, and with the Old Testament, exactly as Christians now see their relationship with the New Testament today. Yet these figures, like we're told in the book of Acts, Moses is saying he will send a prophet like unto him. And the New Testament itself then continues that line, that actually figures of great import are coming, and that we have a duty as the way of Christ, as the truth of Christ, to investigate them for the purpose of salvation.